Of the seven wonders of the ancient world, it is the only one which is still standing. The Pyramid of Khufu in Egypt is an iconic monument which has captivated the world for 4,500 years. More than 10 million tourists come to touch its limestone blocks each year. It represents the pinnacle and perfection of building giant pyramids. It conjures such fascination because the methods of its construction remain unexplained even today. The right angles are accurate to within one fifteenth of a degree. Can we do it today? Is it no? No way. The pyramid in the time of Khufu was a national project of the whole nation. How did the ancient Egyptians erect such a monolith without modern knowledge of civil engineering and above all without any machines? The Pyramid of Khufu is a monument that breaks all the records, the highest pyramid ever built and the one with the largest volume. For three centuries, archaeologists and scientists have tried to solve the enigma of the Pyramid of Khufu. Today, innovative techniques have allowed Egyptology to make a leap forward. Among these techniques is photogrammetry. With its great precision, it enables a near-surgical analysis of the pyramids. And for the first time, I can really see the stones, the angle clearly. The photogrammetric maps can help us to reveal many secrets. I would encourage all of you, do not wait, go out today and buy the photogrammetry. Other Egyptologists believe the key to decoding the mysteries of Khufu lies in moving away from the pyramid and probing the surrounding area. That was how, in 2013, a French archaeologist made an historic discovery. These are the world's oldest known papyrus scrolls. Thanks to the latest digital techniques, we are going to try and solve the last mysteries of the Pyramid of Khufu. To help us, we have three of the world's leading Egyptologists, one French, one American, and one Egyptian. We have obtained exclusive authorization to film from the air over the most wonderful sites of ancient Egypt and carry out digitization on an unprecedented scale. 4,500 years after its construction, Khufu might finally reveal its secrets. I still believe that the burial chamber of Khufu is still hidden inside the pyramid. Welcome to Archaeology 2.0. Cairo, Egypt, a megalopolis of 20 million inhabitants which stretches for around 100 kilometers to the edge of the desert. It is here behind these last buildings that the mysteries of ancient Egypt begin. More than 4,000 years ago, it was here on the Giza Plateau that the pharaohs built pyramids as part of their quest for eternal life. Mark Lenner is an archaeologist. He has been visiting the Giza Plateau for decades, and each time he feels the same sense of wonder. It feels amazing to be here. You know, I've been doing this for 40 years, and yet every now and then I stop and I look up, and it's as fresh as it ever was. And the amazement is, how did they do this? How did they get people to do this? And, and what does it mean? What does it mean for them? What does it mean for us? Before him lies an acropolis covering 300 hectares with three vast pyramids in a remarkable state of conservation. But the one everyone comes to see is the most colossal one, the Pyramid of Khufu. So we have here the Great Pyramid, perhaps the only surviving wonder of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It's the biggest building in the world until the turn of the 20th century covers 13.1 acres, 230 meters to a side. It rose more than 146 meters. It represents the pinnacle and perfection of building giant pyramids. The Pyramid of Khufu is a monument that breaks all the records. It is the highest pyramid ever built and the one with the largest volume. It's a truly exceptional building for its time, given that pyramids were built based on an accumulation of experience acquired over just one century. So it is quite extraordinary. Perhaps most surprising is that after four millennia, the structure has lost less than 10 meters in height, a genuine technical exploit for antiquity. Yet building such an edifice without the technological resources we have today seems near impossible. When you look at it, and you are not an Egyptologist, you can think that no one really can do it. It's true. If you try to do it today, you can't, because you don't have the same dedication 
that the Egyptian had. The pyramid was the national project of the whole nation. It took 30 years and more than 100,000 workers to raise this vast structure, whose main purpose was to host the Pharaoh's sumptuous tomb and to bring him closer to heaven to attain eternal life. It's the Pharaoh's tomb, but at the same time, once inside, it's the place where the king is going to be resurrected. In Egyptian society at the time, people believed in life after death. The king was thought to be the representative, the son of God, who would be resuscitated. So it's not just the king's tomb, but also the place where he will return to life. Hundreds of years of study have yet to reveal the building techniques used by the Egyptians. The one certainty is that it would be almost impossible to rebuild an identical pyramid to Khufu's today. But revolutionary technology should at last throw fresh light on some aspects. Vincent and Jonathan have come from Paris to photograph and scan the pyramid from every angle. Using these photos, they can reconstruct a precise 3D model of the pyramids. This technique is called photogrammetry. The cameras are synchronized. They record images at regular intervals, and the principle is that they are triggered at the same time but from different angles. They also have different lenses, some with a much wider angle than others. That way we can cover the whole pyramid and produce a full 3D model. For Khufu's pyramid alone, the engineers have to take 15,000 photos. But to photograph the summit, it is impossible to climb right to the top of the pyramid. The crew decide to use another technique, the drone. It's very complicated for safety reasons and due to administrative authorization to climb to the top of the pyramids. So we're going to use a drone which will allow us to go as high as we like to play with the camera angles. And then we can stitch together the drone data and the data from this little camera to make an overall model. This rare permission to fly over Giza Plateau by drone will result in models with a precision down to the nearest millimeter, which should help our understanding of the pyramids. I think this model would be very interesting for the scientists because it has unrivaled resolution and it is hard to imagine anyone will get anything better in the next few years, at least with the current technology. You can't operate all year round or just when you want on the sites we study. There can be problems with access. The sites are often open to tourists, so there's often a lot of foot traffic. Some zones are totally inaccessible. Photogrammetry is also the only technique that allows a digital copy of the Pyramid of Khufu to be kept in case it disappears one day. After two full days on the site photographing the monument, the images are sent to Paris. In a few days, the Egyptologist will be able to analyze Khufu with unprecedented precision. And for some, there is a big surprise in store. The first images taken by drone are already giving a fresh viewpoint of the setting in which the Pyramid of Khufu was built. The choice of location was not down to chance and is part of a clear strategy. 4,500, maybe 600 years ago, it was very different. The valley floor was green and lush. The Nile River probably had a major branch flowing very close to the western side of the valley, close to the plateau. There were harbors and waterways, basins, coming in to the foot of the pyramids for delivery of materials and people and, and stone. Khufu's builders chose the Giza Plateau mainly because abundant limestone could be found there. To construct the immense pyramid the pharaoh wanted would require astronomic quantities. But at the time, this was not new. The pharaoh's tombs had been becoming more monumental over the previous decades. But to begin with, the pyramids did not look like the ones we are familiar with today. The first pharaohs built themselves tombs in the shape of mastabas. Mastaba in Arabic means bench, so those first tombs were in the shape of a bench. They were about eight meters high. And then from a certain point during the reign of Djoser, the Egyptians decided to adopt pyramidal forms to house the sepulchers. Egyptian kings built pyramids because they wanted something high, they wanted something monumental, and the easiest thing to do is to build a big pile. Around the world, if you want to build high, the first thing you do is build something pyramidal. 
A century before Khufu, the pharaoh Djoser had the visionary idea of piling up several mastabas like boxes, one on top of another, to build higher. Djoser didn't know it, but he'd just created the first pyramid, whose form would evolve into the smooth pyramids like Khufu's. A model of perfection driven by the pharaoh's obsession to always surpass himself. And yet the plans remain a genuine mystery. Ten days after the first photogrammetric readings, the 3D model of the pyramid is finally finished. Our Egyptologists agree to analyze it. It's amazing because you can see the recording of every stone. Then for the first time, I can really see the stones, the angle clearly. And this actually captured my heart. I haven't seen the Great Pyramid like this. And this is why these maps can help us to reveal many secrets. I would encourage all of you, do not wait, go out today and buy the photogrammetry. <laughs> And if there is one thing that has always intrigued scientists, it's that the Pyramid of Khufu apparently has perfect dimensions. This assertion is very difficult to verify on the ground. So the original baseline of the pyramid is gone with the masonry that's been removed. But the baseline once came somewhere around here to this brass plug put down as a survey marker. So the pyramid used to come until here, but you can see how much is missing due to stone robbing over the centuries. It took Egyptologists several decades to complete accurate on-site measurements of the edifice. But today, in one click, photogrammetry allows us to verify whether the base of the pyramid does indeed have perfect dimensions. We can measure the pyramid's diagonals. So here we've got about 313 meters. Let's measure the other diagonal. That confirms pretty much what we thought. We've got diagonals which are the same length, a right angle, and sides of the same dimension. It is indeed a square. Everything's fine. They didn't get it wrong. The first fact that photogrammetry confirms is that the base of the Pyramid of Khufu is a perfect square with totally precise right angles. The right angles are accurate to within one fifteenth of a degree, which is really a tiny margin of error. At the base of the pyramid, the sides measure 230 meters on average. But we should note that this average varies by only 10 centimeters. In other words, between one side and another, there's a maximum difference of 10 centimeters. Egyptologists all agree. The base of the Khufu pyramid is perfect. But no one today knows how such precision was possible. One thing is sure. The base was not built by bringing in stones, as one might imagine, but was cut directly into the rock of the mountain to save time and save on raw materials. So here the floor is natural rock where they've leveled it. And this is the natural rock as well. And so is this, and this step, and yet another step, all in the natural rock. Here, it's almost four meters high. That means they could not make their perfect square by measuring the diagonals because they couldn't measure up and over the bedrock. They basically wrapped the pyramid around this natural rock that they left sticking up, protruding in the core. To get around the obstacle formed by the rock base, some Egyptologists think the builders used a very simple technique. One theory that could explain these extremely accurate measurements is the use of knotted ropes, long ropes punctuated with knots that allow measurements to be taken. However, it's well known that over a distance of 230 meters, the accuracy of a rope is not that great. It would be hard to attain a tolerance of only 10 centimeters using that technique. In Mark Leonard's view, the explanation is even more astonishing. The Egyptians may well have adjusted the base over time during construction. It was only when they rose the pyramid up above the level of the bedrock hill that they could measure and control the square by the diagonals. But its perfect dimensions are not the most extraordinary feature of Khufu's pyramid. To really understand this fascinating structure, one has to take to the skies. We are at a height of more than 500 meters, and the exceptional feature of Khufu is not readily seen with the naked eye. 
la pyramide de Khufu. La pyramide de Khufu est aussi orientée selon les quatre cardinaux points, et une fois encore, la marge d'erreur est minimale, juste un quart de degré, ce qui est simplement extraordinaire pour l'époque. Our photogrammetric readings confirm the incredible alignment of the pyramid with the points of the compass. How did the builders achieve such a feat? Among Egyptologists, there are two conflicting theories. One of these theories consists in tracking a star from when it rises over the horizon to when it sets. Then bisecting the trajectory will give you the true north. It's a plausible theory, but it's difficult to put into practice with that degree of accuracy. Another school of thought is that the Egyptians did not use stars, but the sun. And then they would somehow align the pyramid based on the shadows of the sun at the equinox. That's another idea. With a simple stick placed vertically in the ground, you just have to follow the movement of the sun to note each time it is at the extremity of the shadow cast by the stick. And so these extremities, once joined, notably during the equinox, allow you to determine the direction of one cardinal point. On these transparent images obtained using photogrammetry, one can distinguish the base of the Pyramid of Khufu, which covers 53,000 square meters, the equivalent of seven soccer pitches. Once again, its construction has confounded scientists since they observed that its leveling is close to perfection. There is practically no difference in level. The foundations are perfectly flat. With sides 230 meters long, there's a maximum gradient of 2.1 centimeters, which is absolutely remarkable. It's barely perceptible. Today, high-tech instruments exist to produce level surfaces. But at the time, the Egyptians had to be inventive. There is the idea that they used water and banks of mud around the perimeter of the pyramid. You could somehow flood an enclosure, say around the base of the pyramid with water, mark the level of the water as a reference line, then drain the water and cut the rock to a uniform depth below that water. The most likely theory is that the Egyptians built a channel around the base of the pyramid which they then filled with water. The water would naturally show the same level around the pyramid. Once a perfect base was built, all that remained was to pile up the 2.6 million cubic meters of stone that makes up the pyramid. On this point, Egyptologists are unanimous. The stones were laid on top of each other horizontally. These blocks at the bottom of Khufu's pyramids are not only very large, but Khufu's builders are laying them horizontally. Older pyramids were built with stones laid at an angle, down in towards the center of the pyramid. No more. Khufu's using big blocks, and he's laying them with horizontal bedding, as you can see here. This, in fact, makes for a more stable base of the pyramid. By laying the blocks horizontally, Khufu was innovating, breaking away from the methods used until then. This superimposition is confirmed by the photogrammetry. Sadi Hawass has been studying the pyramids for 50 years. Today, the Egyptologist has returned to the site to explain one of the key features of Khufu's pyramid, its blocks of stone. I'm sitting on the stones of the pyramid, but actually this area here may be the most important area in the pyramid that can give us a great understanding of the construction of the pyramid. And that is a very important point to show to us that they put above the base long stones, small stones, long stone, small stones. On the outside, the faces of the pyramid of Khufu show great irregularities because they are made of stacked blocks with different dimensions and shapes. This is also confirmed by a closer analysis of the photogrammetric data. So I'm coming very, very close to the Khufu pyramid. And, you know, you can actually see the irregularity of the masonry in any particular place. And even uh, at the bottom, there are big, what, solution cavities, like miniature caves in the limestone. However, when one looks closer, Khufu is not so perfect. There is a simple explanation for this. 
It's messier in the core because it's an economy of labor and material. It would be far more labor intensive to cut really well squared blocks and do very fine joinery for the whole mass of the pyramid. It's easier just to bring irregular blocks, different shapes, and just, you know, saves a lot of time cutting, saves a lot of time making good joins between blocks. The engineers save time by using more rough-hewn stone inside the pyramid, but the irregularity of the blocks made things more complicated in terms of logistics. If you have well-squared blocks, and they're all the same size, your vehicle for carrying them up can be the same size. It's like brickwork. You know, our bricks, our brick buildings, we use bricks all the same size. They're modular. But when you don't have modular stones, you know, one sled, if they brought it up on sleds, doesn't fit all. That is perhaps the biggest enigma of Khufu, the mystery that all Egyptologists dream of solving. How were the millions of tons of stone required for the construction of the pyramid brought to the site? Paradoxically, the most revealing discovery on this question was made a long way from the Great Pyramid. In 2013, a French archaeological mission made history at a dig in Wadi Al Jarf, some 300 kilometers from Giza. So here, between these blocks, there were found about 800 fragments of papyrus from this period. These papyrus were between bad state of conservation and medium state of conservation. This is an incredible discovery. It gives a lot of information on the construction of the pyramid. French Egyptologist Pierre Tadet was in charge of that mission. In 2013, we found a collection of archives which included about 20 or 30 scrolls, many of which were quite badly decomposed. But some were still in a relatively good state. What makes this very important and in a way unique is that these are the world's oldest known papyrus documents, and they correspond to the last year of Khufu's reign. You don't get luck like that many times in your career. This is an amazing find. For me, it might be one of the most significant finds of my whole career, if not the most significant. It took Pierre Tallet several months to decipher the first pieces of this priceless treasure. His analysis reveals that this is a log written by someone called Merer, an inspector in charge of a team transporting stones to the pyramid site. So this is the first testimony on how the work was going there, especially for the transportation of stones, especially stones coming from Torah. These papyruses provide invaluable details on how the blocks were transported from the limestone quarries of Torah on the east bank of the Nile. We can see there are cycles, which are usually four or five days, during which the team will first drag the stones, pull the stones, load them onto boats, and then transport them from Torah to Giza, a journey which would generally take one or two days on a boat loaded with stones. Merer's papyruses also tell us that the Egyptians used the periods when the Nile River was high to transport the blocks. We also learned that Khufu had canals dug to facilitate delivery, thereby creating a direct link from the Nile to the pyramid site. The ancient Egyptians cut a canal on the west side of the Nile, and they cut canals from that big canal connected with harbors at Giza Plateau, and they transported the stones from Torah, and actually from Aswan, the granite, and the alabaster from Hatnub, through the Nile and the canal and the harbors at Giza Plateau. They dug artificial basins near Giza, and these artificial basins were operated by the opening of a channel which fed them with water. One of these papyrus texts describes the opening of this system of artificial lakes. It describes a jetty at a place called the entrance to the Lake of Khufu. And they brought in a large team of workers to remove the piles on the jetty and, presumably, let the water into this artificial lake just when the river began to rise to a sufficient level. This ingenious artificial navigation system allowed boats to deliver the blocks to the foot of the pyramid. From Aswan, these limestone blocks had covered more than 1,000 kilometers to reach Giza, 
Merer's papyruses have so far yielded few indications about the vessels the Egyptians used, but they have allowed Egyptologists an insight into how they were loaded. The average weight of a block is 1.5 tons. But when you consider how many there are in the Pyramid of Khufu, I've tried to work out the load that the boats may have carried at the time of the ancient empire. One might think they could have carried up to 70 tons, between 35 and 70 tons. On that basis, one can imagine maybe 30 or 40 blocks on each boat. In the coming years, the papyruses from Wadi al Jauf will no doubt reveal more secrets. But one thing is clear. Merer's job was done once the blocks were delivered to the Giza Plateau. The stones were then handed over to another team. They used wood to make sleds on which they put the blocks. They were tied on and dragged. They didn't just use men, they also used lots of animals. We have images on inscriptions and reliefs and on tombs of people pulling stones on sleds. Some are damping it down. They sprinkled water or milk, which helps the sled to slide. This is where another great mystery surrounding the construction of the pyramids comes in. How did the builders manage to raise stone blocks, weighing up to seven tons, with no modern machines, and to a height of 147 meters? Especially since the Great Pyramid required an astronomic quantity of stones. The total volume of this pyramid is some 2.6 million cubic meters of stone, which equates to some 5 or 6 million tons of stone. 6 million tons. That's six times the weight of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, or 545 times that of the Eiffel Tower. For years, there have been many theories, some more plausible than others, about the kind of ramps that were used to raise the stones. Photogrammetry brings a new approach. Aerial images may allow us to distinguish traces that cannot be seen with the naked eye. Photogrammetry allows us to clearly make out the vestiges of another ramp which was discovered a few decades ago. And this ramp went to the cemetery east of the pyramid, the area of the mastabas and the small pyramids. When you go past in a car, you don't even realize there's a ramp here because there's a road and all this, and you forget. You don't even look there. But now, with this image from above, you can clearly see it's a construction ramp. This ramp was much too small to bear the immense blocks used in the pyramid. But in all other respects, it's identical to the construction ramps which the Egyptians used then. This ramp consists of two parallel stone walls, which were backfilled in the center by debris, the waste from where the stones were cut. One can well imagine that the monumental ramp that may have been used to build the Great Pyramid was made the same way. The Egyptologists are in luck, because on the Giza Plateau, there is a spot where a ramp is still visible to the naked eye. Here, Mark Lenner shows us the last fragment of a small ramp used to build a mastaba. This is actually an ancient ramp. I'm at the top of it. And the ramp, of course, went up much higher. And it was you know, partly taken down. But remarkably, the ancient builders just left it here. And we think the pyramid ramps were constructed in a very similar way. You have revetment walls of broken stone, and there was lots of broken stone from all the quarrying. And then you fill in between the revetments with limestone debris, chips and sand and gypsum. We now have a good idea how the Egyptians built their ramps, but one major question remains unanswered. What shape was the great ramp used to build Khufu's pyramid? Scientists disagree on this point. Some think the Egyptians opted for a giant spiral ramp wrapping like a serpent all around the pyramid. The problem with the spiral ramp is firstly its huge volume, at least equivalent to that of the pyramid. On top of that, it would have meant a very laborious and long route to reach the summit of the pyramid as it neared completion. You could imagine it would take several kilometers to reach the top of this spiral ramp. Another possibility is a straight ramp to the top of the pyramid but this form poses other problems. We know where the quarry of Khufu is. It's about 350 meters to the south, but it's only 350 meters away. And so to go on a straight ramp from there up to the highest part of the pyramid, it's too steep. 
So probably they went to the lowest one third of the pyramid when you have something like 80% of the mass already completed. You see, because pyramids, the mass decreases. And then they probably did a roadbed on an envelope of debris and retaining walls that they put all around the pyramid with a roadbed that spiraled upward on top. Some pieces of the puzzle are still missing, but today we have many elements on the logistics of the site and the surroundings of the pyramid. Many think that Khufu still has secrets to yield, notably on its internal structure. Unfortunately, even the most advanced technologies cannot yet allow us to see through the blocks. Certain Egyptologists remain convinced there are still many things to discover inside the pyramid. We were granted exceptional access to carry out a photogrammetric scan of the interior of Khufu. This still doesn't allow us to see through the blocks, but these ultra-precise 3D measurements may help us to identify new elements within the pyramid. The continual flow of tourists means our team only has a few minutes and very little room to take the thousands of photos necessary for the photogrammetry. But once put together, this unprecedented model of the interior of the Great Pyramid may allow us a better understanding of what lies inside Khufu. Today, one no longer enters the pyramid by the main entrance located at a height of 17 meters, but by another entrance opened by robbers in the 11th century, which is a few meters lower. They forced this tunnel through the blocks that were already put in place. And they came this far, but then, then they turned. And they actually found the original passage. As confirmed by the photogrammetric data from inside the pyramid, the internal layout of Khufu is quite unusual. Up until then, all pyramids had been built according to the same model. The burial chamber, where the pharaoh's remains would be laid, was always located at ground level. Here, there's not one, but three, two of which are raised up. Look at all the pyramids. You have uh, all these uh, descending corridors, but here, Khufu dug the two chambers, the second and the third, within the pyramid. The lowest chamber is located around 30 meters below the pyramid. Egyptologists call it the subterranean chamber. To reach it, one has to crawl through a tunnel 105 meters long and barely one meter high. The amazing thing about the subterranean chamber is that it's unfinished, so we can actually see exactly how they were organizing the work. They bashed away the stone with big hammer of harder rock like diorite, or they used a pointed chisel, and you can see the marks here, the striations that they left by roughing the rock out. But this is basically one person, probably a man, one person's allotment. No sarcophagus was found here, and this mysterious underground chamber was never completed. Was it built first and then abandoned in favor of other chambers, or was it built last and left unfinished due to lack of time? In Vasil Dobrev's view, Khufu would not have left anything to chance. This chamber was built first, before the pyramid itself. Khufu saw there was a mountain here, and he wanted to know just how solid it was. Today, we would carry out a scan to find out. Before building a nuclear power station, we check what lies below it. Khufu carried out a test in the mountain to see if it could support the monument he planned to build. Vasil Dobrev believes that Khufu was seeking the best place in the pyramid to position his tomb. He thinks the subterranean cavity was abandoned in favor of a second chamber, 50 meters higher, and at the heart of the pyramid. Today, that space is known as the Queen's Chamber. 
It's quite a large space, more than five meters. It's quite wide. And one can imagine that to begin with, the pharaoh chose this space over here to the west to build his burial chamber. But something happened which changed this project. And they moved on to something much more complicated and difficult to achieve. The Egyptologist thinks Khufu changed his mind again and had a third chamber built, this time 40 meters above the ground. The pharaoh did, then, make two failed attempts before finding the ideal position for his tomb, which would explain why Khufu's burial complex had three chambers. This theory is shared by other Egyptologists, which confirm that changes in the plans during construction were quite frequent. From the first pyramid and through to later ones, they always modified the plans in the course of construction. Mentalities changed, beliefs changed, techniques changed, so they adapted. A reign can be a long time, several decades, so the pharaoh may have had different wishes between the start of his reign and the end of it. Archaeologist Mark Leonard does not agree. For him, everything was planned from the start, and the subterranean chamber was not the first but the last chamber to be built. It's as though the king or the king's men came down there, you know, at the end of this 105 meter tube and said, you know what? Now nah, we got a different idea. We're gonna put the chamber higher up in the pyramid. But I don't believe this. I think all three chambers were planned together as part of an initial plan. And it's the subterranean chamber that was the last thing being done, and that's why it's left unfinished. One thing is sure, the highest chamber, known as the King's Chamber, is where the only sarcophagus was found inside the pyramid. Everything points to this being the place where Khufu was buried. After closer analysis of the inner structure of the pyramid, Egyptologists realized that some impressive defenses protected access to this chamber. And today, thanks to photogrammetry, they can move through the pyramid in a few clicks. The data confirms that this very elaborate system begins about 100 meters from the king's chamber, at the point where the corridors which serve the chambers intersect. Vasil takes us to see this arrangement on the ground. You see, here, we're at the crossroads of the ascending corridor, which goes up to the burial chamber. And it's very interesting to note that this corridor has been totally blocked by big blocks of granite. That's a first, because usually when they wanted to block a corridor, they used limestone. Whereas here, they've used granite to block a corridor that goes up. So we are already getting an idea of greater protection. Granite is a much harder stone than limestone. Thanks to photogrammetry, we can clearly see three huge granite stones, which are called plug blocks. 4,500 years ago, these stones sealed off the entrance to the corridor, which went up to the king's chamber. After this first line of defense, to reach the king's chamber, one has to take the ascending corridor. After about 40 meters, one arrives in the famous Grand Gallery. We are inside one of the most spectacular structure that ever built inside any pyramid. You have to understand before that the pyramid was not only a tomb. The pyramid was representing the power and the dignity of the king. And therefore they have to show miracles in, uh, in architecture. The Grand Gallery is one of the miracles that we see inside a pyramid. This gem of architecture measures eight meters in height and 47 meters in length. But despite its majestic appearance, in fact, its role is purely functional. The purpose of this grand gallery was to stop the granite plug blocks. Grand gallery is one element in a system of closure. Since the plug blocks are monumental, they also had to build a vast gallery to accommodate them. 
When you have a corridor one meter wide, it can be simply covered by lintels, flat ceiling pieces. When you go beyond a meter, you need to make a vaulted ceiling to prevent it collapsing. So this wider gallery necessitated the construction of a corbelled vault to hold it up. Once again, photogrammetry allows us to better understand the principle of corbelling. If we zoom in, we can see that the base of each block comes in a little compared to the previous one, by about 10 centimeters, over one, two, three, four, five, six, seven levels, until it completely closes off the ceiling. In this method of construction, the blocks are placed one on top of the other, but with a slight overlap, which enables it to cover a much wider space. The Grand Gallery ends at the entrance to the King's Chamber, but before reaching it, one last obstacle must be passed, a final line of defense that Egyptologists call the portcullis antechamber. This is kind of like a primitive machine. People think that there were big slabs of stone like these put into these slots. The slots are defined by these raised bars of stone. They've been broken away, but you can see where they were. And in these slots, these large granite slabs were portcullis slabs. From the other side of these slabs, they could actually lower the portcullis slabs, boom, 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 and finally close the king's chamber. And this was the second line of defense against anyone coming into the king's chamber, which is just beyond us, to rob the burial of the king. These three huge portcullises, each weighing several tons, block the access to the king's chamber. Along with the plug blocks, they made up a near impregnable protection system designed to deter grave robbers. You cannot imagine that all these people who did this miracle in the, in the angle and the facade of the pyramid and all of this, and they know that the first thing when the king is buried, thieves will enter next day. Then they had to think about protection. They had to think about deceiving thieves. And that's why the whole building and the whole idea of the king and his architect is hiding his burial chamber. It was paramount for the Egyptians that no one should find the king's tomb, but more importantly, to avoid it being plundered. It was very important that his mortal remains stay intact for the whole pyramid engine to work as a kind of big resurrection machine. And everybody else, the entire court, and their resurrection depended on it. So they didn't want anybody to come in here, violate the burial, and basically turn the switch off on this resurrection machine. Protecting their pharaoh's tomb was a way for the Egyptians to ensure their own passage to an eternal life. Today, scientists have carried out remarkable efforts to understand the mysteries of this 4,500-year-old legacy. Nonetheless, many archaeologists think that the world's most famous pyramid has not yet revealed all its secrets. And some even wonder if there is another still-hidden chamber containing Khufu. I always think that this sarcophagus cannot be for Khufu, it's very small. And this is why it always gave me the idea that Khufu's burial chamber is still inside the Great Pyramid. I don't think it's impossible that one day we will discover another room inside the Great Pyramid. I don't think it's probable at this point because the pyramid is mostly solid space and I don't think other rooms would make sense in terms of the overall passage chamber system. Today, we have a vast knowledge of the structure of Khufu's pyramid, and photogrammetry has allowed us to confirm many theories about its workings. But after more than four millennia, other mysteries have yet to be unraveled, notably on how the world's greatest pyramid was built. You will have many things to discover about how they made it in generations to come. We'll still be thinking about the Great Pyramid of Khufu and all the pyramids and the ancient Egyptians. And it's important, you know, because the human career is moving faster and faster. Civilization is evolving so rapidly now. And it, it's important to understand what happened. 
in order for us to understand what is happening now. I'm always saying that we found until now in Egypt 30% of our monuments and Giza Plateau is still hidden, many treasures in it that can reveal the mystery of these pyramids. And you never know what the sand of Egypt might hide of secrets.